Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our third Falls Awareness Week webinar hosted by the Falls Prevention Network and supported by Medline. This session will be recorded. Um, so today's and tomorrow's sessions will look at post falls management, looking at a range of aspects, including the latest learnings and best practice at a national and a local level. So for today's session, we're delighted to have Julie Windsor and Dr Julie Whitney to talk post falls responses. As many of you will know, Julie Windsor is patient safety clinical lead for medical specialities and older people at NHS England and Dr Julie Whitney is clin clinical lead for national audit of inpatient falls at Royal College of Physicians amongst so many other roles. Um, everyone will be on mute throughout the session so please put your questions into the Q&A panel uh, you'll find that at the top of your screen um, as as we go and then we will come to uh, your questions at the end of Julie and Julie's sessions. Um, so uh, I'm now going to try and put Julie Windsor on the screen along with the slides. And right. There we go. Okay, Julie. Okay, over I to you. Mine on slideshow, yeah, now, Simon? Yeah, lovely. There we go. Hopefully, is that all showing okay on your screen, yep. Simon? Yeah, all clear. Lovely. lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Hi, everybody, um, and welcome to this afternoon's session. I'm one of the two Julies. That's not a new uh, double act, uh, although it possibly could be. Um, we don't do it to confuse you, uh, that's just our names. Um, but we're delighted to be here this afternoon. I'm going to um, kick off the session with a little bit of um, going back over some old ground, maybe for some of you, um, but possibly uh, not for the rest of you. So do bear with me as I sort of do a, a bit of a canter through uh, how we got to be where we are today in terms of post force responses. So uh, the background to all of this, and some of you uh, may recall uh, if you've been around long enough, um, that uh, suboptimal uh, care following a hospital fall um, resulting in serious injury was first um, formally identified uh, by the National Patient Safety all the way back in 2011. And they produced the report that you see uh, there in the corner there is the rapid response reports, which is what the publications they used to put out in those days. But the findings will be somewhat depressingly familiar uh, to some of you, I'm sure. Um, is that the, the review of the um, NRLS, the patient the reported patient safety incidents back then, had found um, significant issues, particularly around um, delayed diagnosis of fractures and, and, and head injury, brain injury. Um, that the, the post fall monitoring, particularly neuro was was either absent or just not very good, not very well done that there seemed to be a lot of sling hoists being used to move patients um, and an inappropriate moving of patients with injury, particularly with spinal injury. Um, and that also sadly delays to urgent investigations or surgery. So, you know, doc doctors not being called or called and not coming till quite late and certainly not accessing uh, scanning or other diagnostics uh, for quite some time following the injury. And the uh, report then, well, these, these are like the forerunners to national patient safety alerts, if you like. Uh, they then asked uh, trust to put in place protocols that check for injury before moving patients, that they looked to what uh, safe manual handling methods they were using or what equipment they had, um, particularly with regard to flat lifting equipment, that they look at their alignment and duration of neuro ovs and whether or not it was, or it, um, was the same as what NICE were saying look at the timescales for medical examination and access to investigations and treatment. And the, crucially, I think they were saying, try to align what you're doing on the wards with what to the speed and quality that would happen in an, in an emergency department. Although that's a bit of a moot point, I guess, at the moment, with the pressures on service. Yeah, the thing was, the, the document was successful and it was eventually adopted and uh, accredited by NICE and informed the quality standard 86 um, back in 2015. So what happened after that? Well, um, the National uh, Audit of Inpatient Falls, um, developed by the Royal College of Physicians, 
uh, has been looking and monitoring um, post halls responses for some few years and um, publish on it. And it became uh, evident really after a few rounds of the audit that this remains an enduring issue, this post form management. Uh, it, the the uh, parameters are used, uh, the performance indicators of your pardon used are those that are aligned with NICE quality standard 86. And it measures, uh, you can measure your own performance against that. And as you can see really, you know, there was it, there are some improvements of from say 2019 to 21, you can see on the slides, um, but it's still not good. You know, flat lifting not used in the majority of cases when it probably should have been you know, access to medics, just not as quick as it could be. And that's and checks in for injury before moving, you know, not happening in all in all time. Bit of a time for a rethink, really. Whatever we'd, it's no point keep doing what we're doing because it's actually not actually making much in headway, improving the situation, supporting staff to be able to improve the situation. So it's time for a rethink. So we went back to the data. So I did another um, deep dive into the National Reporting and Learning System for those people on the call who perhaps are not familiar with what that is. Uh, that is the uh, data repository for all of your reported local incident reports. So every time you do a, a, a Datix or an Ulysses, Ulysses, sometimes you use that system. But every time you report a patient safety incident, it goes into your local risk management system. Uh, but also at intervals, it gets uploaded to the national system, and that's the National Reporting and Learning System, currently called the NOLS, about now to be called the LFPSC, but that's a whole other presentation. So um, we, I had a deep dive and had a look into that, and it's important to have a look into the data because it's not just about the numbers. The reports themselves are the staff voices. They're you. They're your voices uh, telling us what happened, if you like. And it's a, what we would call a rich first person narrative. It's written very often by the person who attended to the patient in the first instance. So you, you can get some really rich data from that sort of thematic um, narrative report. Um, it can offer additional contextual insight rather than just numbers that you can collect in an audit. Because you hear the staff telling you the story of what happened, it can give you quite a few uh, pointers, if you like, about what may have been going on or not going on at the time of that uh, occurrence. And it, the um, data can be particularly helpful to complex problems, wicked problems, you sometimes get them called, because it can help to illuminate, to illuminate, I beg your pardon, areas for closer focus, things that you just want to take a bit of a lens to. Um, and we, we quite like to use the vignettes. So this, these are just cut and paste jobs of actually what people wrote. I've obviously anonymised them. And the vignettes of actually what occurred are more powerful than numbers to make the case. And discussion far more important with staff to help understand the issues. So some of you will be aware um, that we re-ran uh, a couple of webinars with the National um, Horse Practitioner Network to discuss our findings uh, back in those days and to sort of chew it over with you really about what we thought might be going on here or what might be useful to have a focus on in the future. Um, rather than focus on, on how many people fell over and what did they break, we were actually more interested in, you know, what happened next really, or rather what didn't happen and why might that have been the case. And we sort of carved it up into a systematic analysis of different types of things that we were considering. And the findings from that were you know, no great surprises, I'm sure. I mean, the reports in themselves, you can get everything from a two word report to a 250 word, per, per, you know, word report. So we thought that sometimes scant detail in reports might be affecting the ability to answer the audit questions that you just didn't when you came to uh, input the audit information. If you didn't have the data available to you in the in the report, then that would actually make might be affecting the report quality in terms of the audit. Um, the reports often don't describe what clinical assessments were carried out prior to moving. You might get a very scant uh, piece of information. You know, so you might some people might do a, a very good job and say, you know, top to toe examination, including X, Y and Z. And then other people just say, don't say anything at all. 
Um, but it did seem um, to us that uh, st it, the reports seem to indicate that staff were unclear about what assessments were required in the first place and what that might consist of. And it came through loud and clear as well that nursing staff, particularly sort of outside the ED acute environment, often just don't have these first aid skills. Or if they did once upon a time, that was many years ago, and they're not, you know, they're, they're not current. Uh, many reports didn't describe immediate care of the injury, even you know, to analgesia had been given, even when a significant injury was suspected. And the access to and training in the use of uh, flat lifting equipment seemed to remain particularly challenging. So we shared all this uh, back with the network, but we also shared them with the Royal College physicians to help inform the next stages of uh, recommendations and uh, guidance work, which I think Julie's going to cover in more detail later. But there were some other drivers for a change as well. So while we were doing the thinking, um, we were mindful of the fact that the new um, patient safety instant response framework was going to be on the horizon quite quickly. Um, and I'm not going to go into any great detail about that because, as again, that's a whole nother uh, presentation. But so I'm sure most of you on the call will be very aware now there is a new way of looking at uh, of a patient safety event. In, and not just the old SI framework of everything, you know, severe or serious injuries, you need to do an investigation. There's a whole new um, framework now about how you might consider your response to a falls event. And so therefore there was an opportunity to rethink and restructure these approaches to the immediate post fall management and to align it with the PSURF program. So there's a whole opportunity there to help to try and make life easier for you guys out there on the shop floor to align our recommendations with PSURF. So that was, we were very mindful of that. And sort of bringing us uh, right up to date really, um, always evolving and learning I put up there. And I think that's it. Just when we think that you've got it solved and sorted, there's always something else and more to do. Um, and that I'm just going to share this with you. This is something that's sort of like coming up quite fast on uh, our radar at the moment, particularly in NHS England, but certainly um, something we're considering with the NAFE team as well. But there's emerging risk out there, and that's our term really for we just think there might be something that's worth looking at in some detail here. And that it's not clear really about this immobilisation of C-spine injury with patients with existing spinal disease. There seems to be variation in guidance and variation in practice out there. And you'll see there's an example, a redacted example from a real report out there where it seems to be not quite clear whether the patient should, you know, with an existing disease should have, you know, blocks of collars or trauma board or what really and there's evidence of some significant harm coming to patients because of this lack of clarity. Um, and what just some initial findings that I've been looking at at the moment is the guidance that does exist out there is not really kept pace with current clinical practice so I've been working with the Royal College of Emergency and Medicine and they're looking to update their guidance because it doesn't really it's not as clear as it might be, particularly with this patient group. Uh, I'm going to do a, another deep dive uh, to see if I can sort of get any more incidents in the same vein as I've mentioned before to try and extract a little bit more narrative information about uh, what might be going on out there before we can sort of start to have some more detailed discussions. Certainly the nice um, guidance out there on spine assessment is old. I think it's 2016. Uh, they, they're saying at the minute there's no plans to update, but we're wondering if we might be able to influence that a little bit and see if we can't try and align all of the guidance together. And also there's a bit of a vote here for the false practitioner, which I'm sure you're all a member of. Um, and if you're not, there's a link there uh, to the NHS Futures platform where you can. But there's a bit of a conversation started there by some uh, colleagues there about people are concerned about this variation in practice and the lack of clarity and it's starting to come through from discussions which I think is really really helpful uh, and helps guide us on the right path really to what we might do to attend to that. And so it's all work in progress, this is very new at the moment, there might be other actions, I'm not clear at the moment who 
that might be. But certainly we think there's some time with the NAIF programme, as particularly as the audit scope starts to extend uh, in, in the near future. So I think there's certainly something around uh, this work now might help inform uh, some of that. So I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to pass straight on to my colleague Julie Whitney. Um, but if you have any questions or anything you'd like to raise, that please do jot it down in the Q&A uh, panel and we'll both have a go at answering them all at the end, if that's OK with you. OK, thank you very much indeed. Okay. And I stop sharing. Go. Right, let me just put. Yeah. Hang on. Hang on. Put that low. Right, we've got Julie. We just need Julie's slides. Julie, could you just show your slides again? Oh, here we go. Here we are. There we go. Yeah, they should be. Should be coming. Yeah. Simon, if you let me know when you can see them. And yeah, then start. Oh, here we are. Here we go. Right. OK, so you should be live and your slide should be live. Oh, I'm just gone. OK. So. Um, hmm. Sorry, I can't see my slides anymore now. What can you see? What what version can you see? Can you see the whole? Oh, it's come back again. That's fine. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Something something odd happened there. Um, right. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, thanks for inviting um, me to come and speak about post fall management. So I'm just going to give a little bit from the from the perspective of National Audit of Inpatient Falls, and uh, and um, some of you have heard some of this. So apologies if some of it's repetition. Um, uh, uh, um, hopefully there's there's some new bits in as well. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, the National Audit of Inpatient Falls um, is a continuous clinical audit. And at the moment we look at all patients in England and Wales who sustain a hip fracture as an inpatient. And we audit activity um, based on um, uh, for what's happened prior to the fall that caused the fracture, um, uh, aligned with NICE Clinical Guidelines 161. And then we also look at post-fall management um, practice um, aligning to the NICE Quality Standards 86. Um, and so I thought, uh, I think Julie's done a good job of this so far, but I thought I'd also um, emphasise from the audit's perspective why post fall management is important. Um, so this data here on the left um, is the key performance indicators for the National Hip Fracture database. So this is how people, once they've had their hip fracture, are cared for. Um, and include things like access to a geriatrician, um, having um, rap, you know rapid and prompt surgery, um, returning to original um, residents. Um, and the dark green um, bars represent uh, patients who have um, had a fracture, a hip fracture outside hospital. And the light green bars represent patients who've had hip fracture in the hospital. Um, and what you can see from this is for five out of six, the performance uh, in hip fracture care is worse for people who have sustained an inpatient hip fracture. Um, so so um, the, these patients have poorer outcomes um, as a result of their hip fracture. And even more importantly is that 30 day mortality after hip fracture is double that of a, 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 of a non inpatient hip fracture. And the reason I want to bring this up is is that it's possible that post fall management can influence some of this, and it may be that the that what's happened, you know, what happens to the patient immediately after the fall influences some of these poor outcomes. For example, if a hip fracture isn't identified, the patient is less likely to have surgery within 36 hours, for example. But it also, I think, highlights just what a frail and vulnerable group uh, of patients we have here. Um, and it highlights the importance of of, um, of ensuring that their care is safe, uh, effective and, and high quality. So our national audit key performance indicators look at multifactorial falls risk assessment um, quality, and then there are three 
um, that look at post fall management. So looking at check for injury before movement, safe manual handling methods and cases that received a medical assessment within 30 minutes of the fall. And the data here, I, um, I downloaded that today. So this is this is up to date national data. Um, looking at how these things have changed, um, Julie had already said that it's difficult. Now there is, you know, things are creeping up um, and, and improving. Um, so it's not all bad news, but, uh, but obviously more improvement would be good. Um, so where we'd got to when we started to think about post fall management was that if you look at um, key performance indicator two, actually three quarters of patients are getting a check. They're getting some sort of check before they're moved. But when we look at that in more detail, uh, about a third of those didn't pick up the hip fracture and all these patients had a hip fracture. So um, what we wanted to do was have, have a little think about what, um, what we meant by a check. What was a post fall check for injury before movement? Um, you go to nice, nice quality standards, AP6. Um, they sort of tell you what to do, but they don't really tell you how. Um, so we started to think about that. Um, and this is kind of what was happening in my brain. Um, when I was starting to think about what um, was a post fall check, um, bearing in mind that we were having to consider um, the how we would um, how we would provide advice and guidance for um, a range of different inpatient settings. So from a mental health trust that has no doctor on site overnight to uh, you know. A, a bustling acute trust that has tertiary trauma services. Um, and so so finding a, a sort of one size fits all was quite difficult. So we um, obviously got our thinking caps on um, and the things that we thought were important considerations were that the the um, the post war check had to be safe. It had to be feasible. So we can't train every single member of um, inpatient staff are in um, in um, you know to a, a trauma level of training, um, uh, you know. It, sorry, there was a, a huge amount of noise, but it seems to have gone now. Um, we can't we can't train people to sort of trauma level training for every single HCA and, and nurse on every single ward in the country. That's just not feasible. So we have to find something that's feasible to be able to do, and it has to be flexible because each setting is going to have its own unique set of um, of of, uh, of issues and challenges. Um, so we set up a multidisciplinary task and finish group to look at this issue and our aims were to um, to uh, to minimise harm from patient to patients from incorrect management after an injurious fall, to ensure prompt access and referral to ongoing treatment when an injury has occurred and to reduce variation in post fall management in inpatient settings. Um, and the objectives were to clarify what we think constitutes a post fall check for injury um, and support the timely identification of injuries that need prompt specific management and then to avoid overcomplicating fall management. So one of the one of the one of the common things that happens in healthcare is that when when you start to sit down and think about things, you know, you, you can end up sometimes making it even more difficult and putting even more steps into a into a process that that actually um, overcomplicates things. Um, and, and then also it became really clear, uh, as Julia alluded to earlier, is that actually, you know, there are, there are some staff on hospital wards who don't have uh, the sort of first aid skills to respond to an injury, um, meaning that a patient in inside a hospital may very well um, not get the same kind of care as a patient who falls outside a hospital, who's picked up by an ambulance and goes to the emergency department for their for their um, assessments and investigations. Um, and, and and that's you know that's the starting point so you need to think about what additional skills and training are required to be able to deliver high quality post fall management um, and then to provide some guidance on how to implement that um, and how to how to think about managing training and competencies um, and you know so going back to that sort of busy diagram I don't I, I think you know we, we've got somewhere with this with this work I think there's there's still lots to do so last year we um, published supporting best and safe practice in post fall management in inpatient settings. Um, and there are two bits of this resource. The first part is the 
the clinical management and the second part is the implementation toolkit. So I'm just going to walk you through the, 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 the clinical management part of this. Um, and this, um, as these things have to do, includes a flow chart um, uh, suggesting actions. Because actually when you when you start to think about it carefully, um, it's there's quite a few complicated decisions that need to be made when you encounter a patient on the floor. Um, so one of the things we wanted to um, emphasise is actually that off, when we see a patient on the floor as a healthcare professional, it, it, you, you feel pain, don't you? It's, you don't like to see it. It's unpleasant. It's uncomfortable and it can induce panic. And so everybody thinks about quick, just get them off the floor as quickly as we can so we don't have to see this and, 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 um, uh, and encounter it and, the, you know, and you know, and, and sort of, you know, sort of ha have to look at the patient in distress and look at the patient on the floor because we know that that's not where the patient should be. Um, but what we want to encourage is actually not not panicking. So the first step of, of, of this is to actually stop, take a breath, undertake your dynamic risk assessment of the environment. We're all taught that in basic life support, aren't we? We don't just rush up to a person. That's the first thing that you do is, is, is you, you um, have a look around and you just take into in, in your um, environment. And then it's important to consider that in some cases, particularly in inpatient setting, a fall could be a medical emergency. So the patient may, be, may have fallen over because they've had a cardiac arrest. And so that the, the first um, response really is a the basic life support response. So determining whether someone is, is responsive, whether they are breathing or not. Um, and then the second consideration is that um, if we think the patient has had a transient loss of consciousness, so we think they've passed out, they fainted, had a seizure, um, actually that requires some specific attention in terms of the medical response that it gets. So we just need to be aware of that and we need to, particularly if somebody's had a syncopal fall, before we get them up, even if they're feeling okay, um, we know the reasons why people might have a syncopal fall because their blood pressure's dropped. So we want to check their blood pressure. We want to check their pulse before we get them, uh, stand them up, even if they're able to move themselves. Um, and then fin the final part of this is um, thinking about checking for injuries to determine the next steps. So as we've already talked about, um, if we suspect a hip fracture, getting someone up in a sling hoist, the standard sling hoist, is probably not going to be the most, most comfortable for them and could exacerbate the injury further. If we think somebody's got a spinal injury, um, we would want to be um, uh, uh, um, keeping them uh, you know, as, as still as possible and immobilising the spine. Um, if, if we suspect somebody's had a head injury, that might not necessarily affect the way that somebody's moved, um, although obviously you would you would be very clear about sort of checking for suspected um, spinal spine injury before you you know before you move them, but you would it would prompt the um, neuro observations uh, once you've got the person up and fo following in the subsequent time after the fall. Um, so this follows something called the look feel move assessment. Now we we arrived at look feel move because. Um, we're aware of the real range of people that might be doing this particular assessment and we are aware that some people will be very comfortable going in and palpating someone's spine to check for tenderness, um, you know, passively moving somebody's joints to look for range of movements and pain and so on. Um, but there will be lots of people who are really uncomfortable about that and would, would require um, a lot of training, a lot of support, a lot of maintaining competencies in that. And we just didn't think that was realistic. So what we mean by look, feel, move is look with your eyes, have a look at the person. You know, um, there's quite a lot you can tell from looking at the person. Feel is what the patient tells us. So what, what is the patient feeling? And then move is asking the patient to move themselves and move the, move the, the, the sort of limbs or joints in question. Um, and so it's, 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 it's fairly simple thing to do without requiring really, you know, sort of slightly more complex um, um, clinical skills. 
So that's the that's the clinical management side of things. And then um, the post fall management implementation toolkit actually talks um, walks you through some of the considerations that you might need to think about if you're going to implement this particular post fall um, um, management um, um, guidance in your own organisation. And it talks about it, it will, will will get you to think about your organisation where you're where your falls happen, um, you know what what training staff currently have, um, doing a gap analysis to determine what's needed. Um, you know, do you have out, out of hours doctor cover? All of those kind of things because all of those are going to influence what what model you might choose to deliver your post fall management um, um, uh, in implementation, um, and also what resources you might need to do that. So I thought I would um, finish this se this session just talking a little bit about um, what's happening next. So there are a few things on the on the horizon. Um, so one of the things is that um, so we so we think these resources have certainly provided a starting point for people with regards to um, checking for injury before moving and guidance as to what the best way to move uh, move um, somebody from the floor might be. Um, what we realise now is actually, um, although the, again the rates of people who are, have a medical assessment within 30 minutes of the falls are reasonably good, so 70%, that means 30% aren't getting that, so we, we certainly do better. Um, um, only only four, well, four fifths of patients are prescribed analgesia, so one fifth of patients aren't prescribed analgesia after a hip fracture. And they get their analgesia a median of two hours after their fall, so no one in our audits gets analgesia before 30 minutes. Um, and, and so it, it got, it's got us thinking about what is a medical assessment. And there's been quite a lot of controversy about who should do these medical assessments and whether they need to be medically qualified. And if they are indeed medically qualified, they may be a very, very brand new F1 that's just arrived in the hospital um, and, um, you know, and, and is charged with doing this medical assessment. So we think one of our next steps is to think about what, what the medical assessment might look like. Um, and then the really exciting what next, which Julie's already talked about, is that we're looking to expand the audit. Um, and so from January 2025, we're commissioned to collect audit data on any fracture and head injuries as a result of inpatient falls. Um, so from a post-fall management perspective, what this should enable us to do is to get a much better idea about how practice is, or what's happening on the, on the ground with regards to managing spinal injuries um, and also managing head injuries, and then think about whether, whether, that, um, whether we need to implement any resources in those particular areas. Um, and then just a brief about the other things to consider after a fall and just a quick update. Um, so we had we've already produced some documents called a hot debrief and an after action review, and we've been revising some of these documents to align with um, with PISA. And so we will be under our under our sort of badge of gaining insight from inpatient falls. We've um, we will very shortly be um, uh, providing some guidance on developing PISA for responses to inpatient falls and providing a new version of the hot debrief called a post fall debrief and a new version of the after action review called the uh, post fall structured review. And the reasons for those changes is that we want to make clear that they're really fall specific um, uh, um, and that whereas the sort of terms hot debrief and after action review are used more generically around PISA. Um, and so watch this space. They're just they're almost ready. Um, and I think that is um, that's all I've got to say now. So we'll leave a bit of time for questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Thanks both Julie's. And um, yeah, uh, been quite coy on the questions today. So we'll we'll start. We've got a really good we've got a really good one um, for mental health. So I work, um, we didn't put a name, but uh, I work for the Inpatients Mental Health Trust as a physio. Our dementia patients really struggle to stay on the floor and won't be um, able to um, won't be able to tolerate until we complete post falls uh, look, feel, and move screening. How do we manage this? Do you want me to answer this one, Julie? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, the, the, it's a pragmatic tool. And if somebody is getting up from the floor and moving, 
I think you can't rule out that they don't have an injury, but they're, they're to a certain extent um, um, communicating that they're able to move um, and um, which is sort of the final part, part of that pathway. And the feel is going to be difficult for someone with advanced dementia who has communication difficulties. You're probably not going to get very many reliable answers if you start asking them if they've got pins and needles in their toes. Um, so you're going to you've already done your look. You, you, the feel is, you know, can they move? Um, you know, again, you've got to think of pragmatisms. It, it, somebody with advanced dementia isn't necessarily going to move their head up and down on commands, but if they're sort of rolling over and trying to get up, that you know they're demonstrating that they're moving without pain. What I would be, what what I would be um, careful of is thinking that if somebody gets up and walks off, they haven't got an injury. Mm. So I've done. Um, I've done some audit on um, patients from care homes that come into the emergency department with missed hip fractures. And um, these, these, you know, there's a small minority of people with advanced dementia who will get up and walk around on a hip fracture, yeah. sometimes for a couple of days. Um, and not they might be, they might have a little bit of a limp. And so I think, I think um, just because somebody's got up, you can't necessarily, you know, confirm that they've not got an injury. Um, you might need to sort of do some post falls observations to be, you know, to, to be confident that they haven't. And if you identify any change in behaviour, so, you know, I, I don't need to tell you in, in your role about sort of, you know, uh, um, looking after people with dementia, but um, obviously be looking for changes in behaviour, changes in mobility and things like that to, to support any, any, um, a, a, any further investigations. Don't oh, know if you've I, got anything to add there, Jules. Um, no, no um, I've, I've, you're absolutely spot on there, um, Julie. I would have said all of that. And, you know, you, you have to be pragmatic in, in circumstances such as these and, and be led by the patient. And there's, you know, what what's the alternative? Holding them onto the floor, you know, you, you know you're just not going to do that. Um, so it's about the observation and doing what feels right at the time for that particular patient. And I would absolutely wholeheartedly agree with the comments about diagnostic overshadowing. So that, you know, people thinking, you know, the dementia is the issue or the cognitive impairment is the issue where actually might be in pain. Um, and that even if it is two days later, and I'm certain I've certainly looked after patients that have come in with old fractures that have just been completely missed and the changes in behaviour put down to all manner of things, um, not least the fact that they've got a femoral fracture or other fracture. So, yeah, I think you just have to. I think the advantage for people in very often in, in mental health environments, which um, we lose very often in acute general care, is they very often know their patients well, they're with them for longer, and they have you know, very good insight very often into changes in behaviour or they're, they're holding themselves funny or something like whatever it is that gives the game away. Uh, so I think, yeah, be, be led by the staff that very often know the patients very, very well. Um, to help you make those decisions about your know, possible potential injury. Okay. They, are very, they are very quiet, aren't they? No, I was going to say, no, they're getting going. They're getting they, going. All, they all right. are there, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> so are there any plans for community guidelines for HCPs working in the NHS? Community guidelines for... I mean, I'm is that assuming... That, yeah, for post falls generally. Um, post falls. I'm assuming. Um, do you mean non inpatient settings? Let's go with that. Yeah, it, for non inpatient settings. Um, we haven't, from an from an audit perspective, because we are commissioned to to look after inpatient falls. So we've, um, you know, I would be delighted if we were commissioned to look at falls going out of the hospital into community settings. Um, unfortunately, that's that's uh, it, it doesn't seem to be on the agenda for for HQIP who who um, who commissioned the audits. So for, from a from a national audit perspective, that's not something I did, I think we'd be able to do. Um, but I agree, it's it, it it's important, isn't it? And I think um, I think the the there's I do a lot of work clinically in care homes, and I think there's a there's a lot of potential for the post the resource that we've developed for inpatient settings to be applicable to care homes and post fall management in care homes. Um, uh, one of the ways that we're, we've used it particularly is so where we know there are patients who 
who fall a lot in care homes and um, uh, we want to avoid hospital admissions for them is that we also do specific post-fall management advanced care plans um, so that people are, are you know know and understand exactly what's what, what needs to happen when somebody's had a fall um, but there's quite a lot of different considerations in terms of pathways because we know for a person who's had an inpatient fall they've got some access to medical care they've got some access to investigations um, and it's a whole different ball game so we'd be back to that um, we'd be back to that sort of um, scary mind map I think but I, I, don't, I, I don't disagree that it's something we should be doing <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And um, in terms of knowledge, notwithstanding that the person who's just written that comment obviously knows because they presumably work there, um, I'd like to be able to see more um, narrative information about what exactly the challenges are and how those might be different in community settings. I'm thinking of not necessarily in care homes, but particularly people in their own homes mm. uh, being looked after by domiciliary type health and social care staff and I think maybe we'll start to get some more uh, rich narrative data coming through as the LFPSE reporting tool rolls out so that's very much being started in primary care if you want to call it that whereas before there wasn't a reporting system well they they could they, they always could report in to the NRLS of course but but didn't for various reasons um, but the LFPSE is actually is starting in primary care so uh, and it's more you know it's, they're more far ahead with the rollout there than they are anywhere else at the moment but of course the whole of the health and social care system will be re moving to LFPSE reporting so there'll be opportunity in the future for us to deep dive into that and maybe get some of that rich uh, information that sits around you know why people are, uh, might find it to be a challenge and how, help inform the process in the way that the other work has done so I think there's real potential going forward, absolutely. OK, great. Yeah, she um, they came back and confirmed, oh. yeah, it was community NHS trust seeing patients at home and finding them on the floor. So hopefully yeah, we've yeah. answered that. Yeah, and I think um, I, I think sort of coming back to that. So one of the things one of the things we thought at the beginning was that um, uh, uh, we just all we need to do is ask people who work in the ambulance service and the emergency department what they do and then we'll mm -hmm. we'll have a good idea what we should be doing in inpatient settings and actually what when we when we deep dived into that there's kind of there's protocols around managing spinal injuries and head injuries but actually there's there's no there was no sort of specific um you know they, they just basically say oh, we just look and see if it's shortened and rotated and you know and they've got pain in their hip and then we'll suspect a hip fracture um, but it was, you know, the, there's there's no sort of specific assessment that that was recommended that anybody did. Um, and so so I think that I think there's a really good point in that, you know, and particularly if you're a physio, for example, you just go into someone's home and they're on the floor, you know, then, you know, what what do you do then? Um, I think we, um, I, d I don't know where to suggest we start with that work, but I agree that it needs to be done. And it might be that actually we can, it could hang on the coattails of what we've done. And we could just think about how that's adapted to a um, mm. to a community setting. It might not be too difficult. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to go on to another question. OK, so let's, uh, there's a couple of, I'm going to try and take them in because obviously they've, they've really got going now. So, um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, there was a couple of resources questions. So I'm going to try and sort of maybe lump those together. So will there be an option of just the first section of the post fall leaflet to provide to staff as a reference following training rather than all of it, including the implementation section? Um, do you know what? I thought we'd done that at a, a sort of right at the beginning because I definitely gave a, just the flow charts, um, a copy of a PDF, the flow charts to somebody who was an early, uh, early um, implementer of it. Um, but I wonder if it's just something that's just not gone onto the RCP resource page. And um, uh, uh, having thought about that, I think having the having the flow sheet on its own without the sort of look, feel, move guidance um, is probably not a good idea but I think if it what what might be helpful is if you had if we just had the two documents you know and you could just have the resource the you know the, the clinical management section um separate and that from the implementation toolkit so you're not having to print out masses of um mm. masses of pages um we can have a look at that because that should be something that's fairly straightforward to do um and I was just um my computer is playing up a little bit I was just going to see if I could put the um 
um, the, the link to it on here. I don't know if we can put the link to the um, to yeah, the, to the results on here. It, yeah, if you, um, if you can find it and put it into the Q and A panel, Julie, yeah. then um, then yeah. we should be, that that should be there for everyone everyone to see. Um, uh, so just while we're on 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 resources, while you're while you're doing that, so have you um, have you considered producing a video? Lots of people like this because people like a video. Um, <laughs> so have you considered producing a video resource for staff around doing a post for body check? We absolutely have. Um, the 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 problem with the the problem with with um, with what we've done is that we we didn't actually have any resource to produce these documents. So we produced these documents with um, sort of with the goodwill of, of the task and finish group from the national audit. Um, uh, but I've had some promising discussions about funding to produce some videos. So um, so hopefully we will do that at some point. Good news. Just a resource comment uh, that occurred to me from previous conversation from the previous questions uh, about the PSERF documents. So when they're finalised, they will be available. Uh, well, they'll be available on the RCP NAIF, um website, of course, but they'll also be available on the PSERF website on NHS Futures. And we'll also make sure that they go into the Falls uh, Practitioner Network platform as well. So there'd be lots of different opportunities for you to be able to get those documents. Great. OK, um, and then there was one. So apologies if I missed this. How do we get a copy of the look, feel, move screening tool? Ah, that's it. So it's in the in the document. I'm just going to put in. I'm not sure who to reply to to put it in. But, um. Um, I'm Again, I, I've just put it in as an announcement. Uh, oh, have you? I've, then, oh, I've replied to, to oh, no, reply, Anne yeah, Marie's reply, thing. Yeah. So there's a link there to where you can find it and download the whole document. OK, so we've got quite a few new questions we haven't published yet. We're trying to just stay <laughs> on top of it. So uh, we'll come to those in a minute. So how do you advocate the use of flat lifting equipment in an area where staff may have been trained but not necessarily competent due to the frequency of use? I know you touched on this. Um, uh, Julie um, Windsor, um, mental health um, in particular in relation to spinal injury, hip fracture. Shall I start with that? Did one? you want to? Yeah, I think this yeah. one for you, isn't it? Start with. Yeah, um, this is a really tricky question, really tricky question, isn't it? And I think this has to have come down to some locality discussion and agreement, and we can't really um, legislate for that because each unit will be different but there's something to be said i think pragmatically if you're going to invest in having flat lifting equipment you don't always have to use it for the patients with who you suspect for an injury that you can use it at other times it's not the special thing that only get used on special occasion by using it more frequently for other purposes for other transfers for other lifts might keep skills fresher so that might be a, a way to think about it another way to think about it might be to um, segment your staff groups so that you have a, a, a certain cohort of staff that are you know are trained initially and then there's some sort of retraining or competency freshening type uh, training program that you institute for a, a for a, a certain group of people because it's that would be easier to do rather than keep everybody's competency up which is a huge task particularly with staff churn as it is um so you might think about that certain types of staff now they might be i don't know they could be you know, they could be therapists, they could be practice educators, they could be other members of staff who have this as part of their extended uh, skill set, if you like. And then if that person moves on or goes elsewhere, the person coming into post has to assume that skill set or if not, it needs to be divvied up and passed on to somebody else. You don't lose it when the person in themselves goes, but the, it remains with the post holder. So you could think about it in perhaps different ways, but I mean, in principle terms, you know, should anybody be lifting any using any equipment that they don't feel confident or competent to use? No, they shouldn't. 
um you know i think that's that's generally the bottom line isn't it because you 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 don't you're not confident you're not confident and that's the end of it but there are ways perhaps of tackling those confidence and competency bits that maybe just require a little bit more wider thought and thinking about it in a slightly different way perhaps i'm sure that doesn't help much but i'm just trying to, to, to expand a little bit on what it might be quite a linear thought process sometimes that all staff need me to do to know how to do this but you can't maintain competency for all staff all of the time Jude, is there anything you um, I don't think there was much else that I, I was going to. The only thing that was springing to my mind when I was thinking about this is that um, sometimes sort of using some QI type methodology, so sort of actually sort of sitting down and doing a process map about, you know, why patients aren't, you know, why why the safe lifting wasn't used, um, you know, whether or not you have equipment uh, mm. um, there might help you sort of work out where the, where the issues, you know, where the real challenge is like. Sometimes I think we can assume it's one reason. Obviously, if you don't have Blacklisting equipment, full stop. Then you're not <laughs> yeah. going to be able to use it. But um, but it, there might be other other reasons why um, why uh, you know people aren't using the flat lifting equipment or aren't being confident using the flat lifting equipment, and so that so on that you perhaps might not have necessarily thought about. And so some of these sort of QI methods are, are sometimes quite helpful for sort of digging down to the real the real issues. Okay, um, let's go with, okay, um, so sometimes unable to convince patients to stay safely on the floor until doctors arrive and it's causing more distress to patients that, um, than not allowing them to get up um, such circumstance, in such circumstances where, um, where do nurses, I think that's meant to be, where do nurses stand, I think. So, um um, do you want me to go first? No, you can't, you yeah, can't. I mean, the, um, the, within the post floor management resource, we're not expecting patients to stay on the floor until the doctor arrives. So we're expecting people to be able to work through that flow process with um, sort of bearing in mind the competencies and training that's needed to do that um, on, on the ward and unit. And that's going to be an you know, sort of a process uh, at a, that's a organisation ward level. Um, that you'd have to sort of make and determine. Um, but we weren't anticipating that patients were expected to wait on the floor until a doctor arrived. It was that the, the whole point of this is that actually the check can happen. We don't want patients to be pulled off the floor so quickly without any consideration, but neither do we want patients to be lying on the floor for, for a long time. It's undignified and it's you know and it will lead to poor outcomes so we so we, we definitely did want to advocate for that so there is this you know what, what we what we hope that the look feel move does is provide this framework for um for non-medical people to be able to do a sufficient check to get somebody off the floor safely and in a comfortable place um, and and then then obviously the medical uh, assessment is required after that if you suspect an injury I don't know, Julie, have you got anything else to add? Uh, no, not much. And as much as I would absolutely agree, you know, that was the whole purpose of doing this work is that we don't want patients being on the floor any longer than is absolutely necessary because of all the risks in terms of outcome. I mean, you know, the risks for long lie, hypothermia, pressure or pressure sore development and worse, for abdo, et cetera. Uh, we, we don't want that. And certainly, and I was, I was thinking, I was thinking about the work we did um, as the pandemic kicked off. Do you, do you remember that when we were looking at, uh, we were asked very quickly by the Association of um, Ambulance Chief Execs to produce something for care homes in the in the in the instance that there would be no ambulance coming at all. That was the brief we were given. Uh, if or if they were coming, they would be several hours down the line. Um, and what advice should we give to care homes about you know, caring for the patient? And this is what sort of, in, again, informed some of this work that we were actually did. And, you know, we're being very pragmatic about it, really, about, you know, how you can make a, a, the best assessment that you can at the time and then make a judgment. You know, if you've got to get them up off the floor, what is the safest way that you can do that to keep so that they can have some analgesia, have some hydration? Um, and to keep them comfortable and as safe as you possibly can until the medical view can arrive. And we appreciate that in some care settings that can be some considerable time. So we sort of following those main principles, really. 
OK, um, now there was a question from Dr Mike Wilkinson. Um, I am a falls and syncope, I hope I said that right, clinician um, <laughs> and also geriatrician. You just put those big long words in to confuse me. Um, so <laughs> we have um, we have recently designed and launched a number of falls assessments electronically. We use Nerve Centre. This includes the post fall nursing assessment and post fall medical assessment. Our aim is to standardise the quality of post fall review. They contain links to our local guidelines and the look, feel, move diagrams. I'll be happy to feed back to you more um, info once we have audited how how they change care following a um, fall. Um, um, if, of, if of interest, happy to demonstrate them. So it was sort of question, <laughs> co you know, comment, offer of help. Uh Mike, I think it would be fantastic yes. to see how those work. We do, we, um, we, I think, you know, we put things out there and then we hope that people can give us feedback and, you know, um, uh, see how it works. And I think what we'd also, what we'd also, and this is a shout out to anybody else, is that one of the first things we did with the post fall check was actually get people to send in what they're, what they're doing now. Yeah. And so if, if there are people that got a, a sort of, uh, have, have really thought about what they're doing with the medical assessment what is a medical assessment we don't want to repeat you know reinvent the wheel so we'd be really grateful if people were happy to share um what they'd done so that we can sort of use that as our starting point for for thinking about what the medical assessment is um i um mike i'll put my i don't know if my emails are anywhere but i can put my email in the chat and um yeah. and you can um get in touch yeah, if you just yeah. put it in the if you put it in the Q and A, Julie, rather than the yeah. chat, so I think the chat only we can see as the. As oh right, the okay, yeah. Um, so if you I just put it in I, the Q and A, I'm, if I'm new to all this Q and A stuff, but I'm yes. I'll make an announcement. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. If that's uh, if, you're, if you're okay to share that, um, yeah, we had another couple. I think this one was from Natalie Andrews. Um, there's a couple of comments, and then she put her email address in as well. Happy to be contacted to discuss barriers if they would like to further. My uh, my main concern is long wait for ambulances, yeah. long lie on the floor, yeah. and then. The other side of that was we have a process flowchart for our community team for witnessed and unwitnessed falls. So I'm not sure if those came from two different people, although the same one. Um, but again, that that whole um, yeah. So Julie, if you put your email in the Q and A, then I think if there's if it, there's, it should be there now. Yeah, hang on. Let me just. Uh, oh, has that not come in? I can. Uh, it's got a hand it's up. Somebody else has seen it because there's a thumbs up against it. It's that. Okay. Um, so I'm just conscious we're slight, yeah, running slightly over. Um, so will you send copies of the presentation? Um, so I, I mean, we will obviously put a page together like we did for last uh, last year's Falls Awareness, where we put the recordings, the presentations, the certificate of attendance. Um, so we're happy to do that as long as you're happy to share your your presentations. Um, and then can you clarify flat lifting equipment? Are they different from full body hoist? Uh, possibly not. I think what we're looking for is something that uh, supports the person in supine in lying, including their head um, to their toes and lifts them in a flat uh, yeah, so they don't way. bend in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I was just thinking, I was trying to think, how could I put that? So I so would say any, any equipment that fits that brief, whatever it's called, is what we mean. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, there's so, another one that gave us, well, there's a couple. So there was um, this, um, this would be great as part of sim training. Is anyone mm. doing this already? I um, don't know a couple of trusts are. Okay. I do, yeah, they're, they're, they are about, perhaps ask the question on the network. And they yeah. might be able to get in touch with you about that, because yeah. I, I certainly know of two that, are, that do it as routinely in their sim training. That's a really it's good a idea. Question. Yeah. 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 So and again, anyone, you know, you can, I think now I've published that, I think anyone can reply to Rosie's Rosie's question there in the in the Q&A as well. Um, so there's a, another anonymous one. So I think it's more of a scenario. So patient has dementia, lives alone on anticoagulant, ob stable post fall, no obvious injury externally. Should we still convey patient to ED for CT considering the patient is on anticoagulant? Uh, 
Well, I think that's the, probably the number one most frequently asked question, is it not? Um, so you'll be aware of the the nice the updates of the nice head injury guidance, um, which currently, uh, if you if you took it to the to the letter, uh, would suggest that you probably should. Uh, however, um, each person is different, and there may well be advanced care plans or other advanced directives. Uh, that should probably be in place for such individuals that should uh, make it clear that it's not their wishes or it's not in their best interest or whatever the decision is. Um, and the risk benefit needs to be, the decision has to be taken prior really to the incident itself. Um, but if you're met with the, the patients on the floor and there isn't such one, I think probably you should do the right thing and leave it for the emergency department to decide uh those risks versus benefits notwithstanding that for some poor frail individuals that might mean a long attendance in ed but all the more reason why those conversations pro should probably be had in advance because we probably know who they are don't we you know these pieces of people on your case list and that their falls risks you should be well aware of yeah, I, I agree, so. Julie. And, 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 and certainly um, in the work I do in care homes, we, when we're thinking about sort of specific advanced care plans, for somebody on, on regular anticoagulation, that would be one of the considerations. Firstly, obviously, the revisiting the, the sort of risk of, 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 of stroke um, or thrombosis or, or, you know, whatever the reason for their, their anticoagulation is against their risk of falling. Um, I mean, usually it's weighted towards the anticoagulation unless somebody is really falling a lot and hitting their head a lot. Um, and um, uh, um, and the, the other thing we've been looking at with our care home residents, which are obviously sort of a big, a big cohort of these, is whether we can have alternative methods for investigation. So is there a way we can have a, a clinician review the person um, at home and then send them in for a CT head without having to go via ED. Um, uh, so that there might be alternative ways to, to avoid that, but they'd be, they need to be set up as sort of recognised pathways of care. OK, um, right, so uh, just conscious of conscious of time, so I'll go to the ones that have kind of been liked most. Um, so community urgent crisis response services are now asked to assess assess post falls in the community if obvious need for paramedic is ruled out what training is there to assist the community teams with this development very good I question think... i mean there's a, there's a couple of good apps i don't know what well, i say there are a couple of good apps there are two apps uh, on the market that uh, support st any member of staff to make decisions and when to call an ambulance or not which includes um, a degree of assessment for injury, particularly, and for other red flags that you might want to uh, get them to an ambulance sooner rather than later, that might be of interest. But I, I'm not aware uh, of any national um, guidance uh, for community staff. I think we sort of covered that a little bit earlier on, really. Um, there were some examples, I think, given in the uh, winter pressures document that came out last year from NHS England. I think there's been some examples in there. Uh, I could try and find that and, and put the link through to you. Um, but, you know, these are things that people have locally developed. Yeah, and I, th I, I think, you know, you, you probably have to do it locally because we've, we've not looked at it nationally. But if you make a start with the with the 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 document that I've just shared, mm. actually a lot of the things in that document. So you're looking for, you know, has there been a transient loss of consciousness? You know, do you suspect an injury? Um, and it's just, it's it's not necessarily, the assessments are going to be pretty similar. Um, it's just the outcomes are going to be different. So your outcome in, you know, in, in, in this case is going to be, does this person need to go, you know, secondary care for more investigations? Can they stay at home? Rather than you know the the the, the decision making the outcome of the decision making tool for the inpatient setting. So the so the actual processes you might find are, are, are more similar. It's just that the out you, you know thinking about the outcomes are going to be different. And again, those outcomes probably do need to be thought about locally because it will depend on you know what, do you have an acute a virtual ward or an at home service or you know uh, what services are available to be able to support the a person stay at home. Um, it's going to differ across the, you know, across the um, 
the country. OK, there's just one really one more. Um, please, can I have a link to the care home work you did re residents lying on the floor with packet uh, paradigm? Oh, my goodness. Right. Uh, paramedics aren't coming uh, um, and taking a long time would be very grateful. I know obviously Julie you put your your email um, so and that's oh, Jeanette thanks. Beamson from Dudley Group so maybe Jeanette if you get in contact with Julie or obviously we will put yeah, we'll we'll share the, stuff. Yeah it was on the BGS site for a long time I haven't, I haven't looked lately I have to say and, and it was what the caveat of course was this was in the time of Covid you know, and it Although was, it's uh, probably more relevant now than it was at the time of COVID <laughs> because actually we did end up having such a, a big problem waiting for ambulances. So, yeah. You know, in April 2020, everybody thought that, you know, nobody would be able to be looked after in sort of routine um, health care. And so we were setting, you know, setting things up for this, that sort of, you know, that situation. And actually, in reality, now that, you know, there are people who are falling in care homes who are have to wait you know hours sometimes for an ambulance to come so so the caveat is please you know that it that was it was developed in it in the time of covid um but but it might be useful um i don't know where it is though julie um i have to I'll say i'm trying to know. look for it now but my computer's just gone on a go slow i think i've confused it completely <laughs> if i find it i'll put it in the in the chat oh hello yeah. OK, well, we can always, you know, we can always share it on the on the Falls Practitioner Network as as well. Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, so I think let's obviously we're <laughs> 10 minutes over. So <laughs> I know we've still got a lot of people that are still on. So thank you very much. Uh, and also thank you to Julie and Julie. Really brilliant session, as always. Very informative. Loads of great uh, comments. Lots of uh, nice feedback. Um, so hopefully people have found it of real, real value. Um, so we uh, we will be continuing the post falls management uh, theme to, in tomorrow's webinar. So we've got a local QI uh, project from Shona McKinnon, um, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So I think that ties in really nicely to this session. So hopefully you can um, you can get back on for that one. I know tomorrow could be quite challenging, um, but uh, obviously we do record all the sessions. So if you're not able to pick it up live, then you can pick up the recording on the same link that we've sent you um, uh, to pick up the recording. Um, and we will obviously put a page together after Falls Awareness Week with all the recordings of all the webinars, like I said before. So Julie and Julie, thank you ever so much as always. And thank yeah, you. thank you everyone for taking the time to uh, to join us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow for more post falls management. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye everyone. Yeah.